Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted that you've decided to join us. You probably know by now that we studied the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church, and this particular series is on the book of Luke. That would be the third gospel, if my memory serves me correct, in the order which we have it in our Bibles. And this particular lesson is lesson number five in that series from May 2 of 2015, and it's entitled, Christ as the Lord of the Sabbath. Christ as the Lord of the Sabbath. That should be interesting. Uh, I'm sure there'll be plenty of things to talk about. But as always, we're going to ask you, hopefully you have your Bible available handy so you can check on us to make sure we're <coughs> quoting it correctly. But we'd also like to ask you to uh, bow your heads with us as we begin in a word of prayer. Our wonderful Father, we recognize your presence with every one of us now. You promised that we're only two or three gathered together. You, would, you will be present. We know, in fact, that you're everywhere. Um, and yet we, we, we sometimes seem to forget that you're right here. We ask now that you will guide us and direct us as we study this very important subject about the Sabbath, about how you observe the Sabbath and your guidance and direction for us, how we should observe and worship on the Sabbath. May we learn more. May we share it with those who might be listening or watching as our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Christ as the Lord of the Sabbath. What does that mean? Do you know anybody who is Lord of Friday or Lord of Thursday? No. Well, Luke we should mention very specifically, was not a Jew. He did not grow up with the Jewish prejudices and the Jewish ideas, going to the synagogue, worshiping on Sabbath. He spoke more frequently about the Sabbath in his two-part history of the early church, that is, you put Luke and Acts together, he wrote both of those, than any of the other gospel writers. There's more about the Sabbath in Luke than there is in Matthew, Mark, or John. I mean, num mention, if you're talking about just the number of times the Sabbath is actually mentioned. Now, John goes at great length talking about things that happened on particular Sabbaths. Luke was also of what nationality? Greek. He was Greek. But he clearly believed in the seven-day Sabbath, and he believed it was intended for Christians and Jews. I read these words from Ellen White, Prophets and Kings, page 183. Christ, during his earthly ministry, emphasized the binding claims of the Sabbath. In all his teaching, he showed reverence for the institution he himself had given. In his day, the Sabbath had become so perverted that its observance reflected the character of selfish and arbitrary men rather than the character of God. Wow. Christ set aside the false teaching by which those who claimed to know God had misrepresented him. So what was one of Jesus' missions when he came here? represent the Father correctly. And to represent the way Sabbath should be worshipped on correctly, because that's the way we worship God correctly. So why is it that so many people who call themselves Christians no longer observe the seventh-day Sabbath, but they worship on Sunday instead? They've been deceived. They've been deceived. Yeah. Wow, how could well, that the, happen? The deceiver of the whole world, remember, yeah. from Revelation 12 is down here. That's what it says. One, one of the most famous passages about the Sabbath and Jesus in the Bible is found in Luke chapter 4, verse 16. Let's have a look at that in just a moment, if I can get my cursor to work here. Then Jesus went to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, and on the Sabbath he went, as usual, to the synagogue. He stood up to read the scriptures and was handed the book of the prophet Isaiah. He unrolled the scroll, found the place where it is written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has chosen me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recover of, recovery of sight to the blind, to set free the oppressed and announce that the time has come when, people will save, when the Lord will save his people. <laughs> Jesus rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. All the people in the synagogue had their eyes fixed on him as he said to them, This passage of scripture has come true today, as you heard it being read. 
What does that mean? How did they understand it? When they thought about it for a while, they said, you mean he's claiming to be Messiah? Wow. Well, it took them a little bit more to think about it, a mm -hmm. few more a few more things that he brought up. Well, let's complete the picture here a little bit. Uh, what's a synagogue? What do we know about synagogues? A group gets together, a place of meeting. Synagogue means together. something like community. A community would be uh, a communion, would be the Latin. Com synagogue would be the Greek. Congregation is a good word, yeah. Very good word from, from, from Latin. What were um, the origins of synagogues? Well, that's a good wasn't, question. Wasn't there a certain circumstance like maybe the temple wasn't available or something? and so? They well, remember, there's only one temple. <coughs> it's in Jerusalem. So in terms of doing the temple ceremonies, you have to go to Jerusalem. But from some years, we don't know exactly how long, maybe two or three hundred years before the time of Christ, it was decided that if there were at least ten Jewish families in a certain village or a certain town, it was expected that they would establish some kind of a place where they could come together and worship, and that was called a synagogue. What did, how did they, you know, for, for, for Christians today and other religious groups, uh, our weekly visit to the church is, uh, is um, a way we, we foster mm -hmm. our, uh, our religious um, ideals and, and what we understand and our spiritual growth and so on and so forth. What, what, what did they do well, back when they, they could only make it to church uh, once a year? Well, but remember, they're supposed to have these synagogues, and the synagogues, they went every Sabbath. But not only every Sabbath, because during the week, those same synagogues were the schoolhouses for the Jewish boys. Not Jewish girls, they didn't go to school, but for Jewish boys. But some of the Jewish girls got themselves a good education. Look at Mary and Elizabeth. You know how they did it, but they did. Well, what about, um, I don't know, what about the time of Abraham? Or I'm just trying to, I mean, there was a time when those synagogues came into being, it's my understanding, for a purple, particular purpose, but there were times when they didn't have those things. All yeah. they had officially, as we understand it, the only physical place they had was the temple, which was... Uh, that wasn't built till David, till Solomon's day. Right. Uh -huh. Hebrews so, 1? Yeah. Yeah. In many and various ways God yeah. talked in the, in the past. Mm -hmm. Exactly. He, in, in the days of Abraham, each man was supposed to be the priest of his family. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, there's a lot of places in, in the New Testament we don't have time to read in even nearly all of them to talk about Jesus worshiping on the Sabbath. Look at just a few. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go to Mark 1, 21. Jesus and his disciples came to the town of Capernaum, and on the next Sabbath, Jesus went to the synagogue and began to teach. Look at Luke 2, Luke, I'm sorry, Mark 6, verse 2. On the Sabbath, he began to teach in the synagogue. Luke 4, 16, we just read 4, 16 to 13. Luke, look at, uh, Luke 6, 6 to 11. On another Sabbath, Jesus went into a synagogue and taught a man whose hand, right hand was paralyzed, etc. All, many of these are connected with miracles that he did on the Sabbath. You go to Luke 13, verses 10, 10 and following. One Sabbath, Jesus went into the synagogue. You go to Luke 14, I mean, Mark, uh, Mark 14, Luke 14. Well, when Sabbath, Jesus went to eat a meal at the home of one of the leading Pharisees and performed a miracle. So if you were to take time to read all the verses where talk about Jesus behaving on the Sabbath and in what he did on the Sabbath, and even all the disciples, what they did on the Sabbath, you would find out a lot of information. There is no place in Scripture where the, I mean, let's, let's be honest about in the, what we recognize as our Bible, there's a lot of apocryphal writings that we're going to talk about in a moment, but no place in the recognized scriptures where any Jesus or any of his disciples even suggested that they should worship on any other day. And I would like to add, I'm going to add some interesting bits and pieces here. I hope you'll enjoy. In fact, the first unambiguous use of the term Lord's Day for the first day of the week, in this instance, the Resurrection Sunday, appears in the little apocryphal book Notice not the Gospels, not any of the letters in the New Testament. The apocryphal book called the Gospel of Peter, which was composed, our best guess is, around A.D. 175. And I will read that passage to you. 
And in the night in which the Lord's day was drawing on, and the soldiers kept guard two by two in a watch, there was a great voice in heaven, and they saw the heavens opened, and two men descend from thence with great light, and approach the tomb. And that stone which was put at the door rolled of itself, and made way in a part. And the tomb was opened, and both the young men entered in. And at dawn, upon the Lord's day, Mary Magdalene, a disciple of the Lord, fearing because of the Jews, since they were burning with wrath, had not done at the Lord's sepulchre that things which women are wont to do for those that die and for those that are beloved by them. She took her friends with her and came to the sepulchre where he was laid. The apostle, I'm sorry, the gospel according to Peter, and that's uh, section 9, in verse 12, written approximately 175 A.D., and you can find that if you uh, have access to some of those ancient documents in the Anti-Nicene Fathers in volume 9. So, Okay, having said that bit of historical background, wh why should we keep the Sabbath? Why do we need to go Back to... Learning primarily. Okay. If we and talk about worship, but really worth-ship. In other words, God has something of value, and it's something, a time to learn. Mm -hmm. And that God doesn't force it and intimidate us mm -hmm. with it. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> but no, we know that God is everywhere, so why do we need to go to church? Can't we just stay at home? Be more well, comfortable. Share and learn and, mm -hmm. and uh, tussle with the words. And so what's special, and you've already mentioned one of the things special about going to church is a place for corporate worship, fellowship, and acknowledgement of those watching us that we honor God's commandments. There and is a, a certain growth that occurs when you gather together and you mm -hmm. break open this book and you chew on these things together. That's one reason why I like coming to this to this uh, format here is um, <clears throat> talking about these things, questioning them with other people and thinking about them. I always leave with uh, a greater understanding and certain kinds of enlightenments and acknowledgement that I never had. And yet, you know, when you bring others together on the Sabbath, that's at least in our worship experience, that's the Sabbath school specifically, that's, <laughs> that's part of that. Yeah. And then Hopefully, traditionally, in a traditional setting, the pastor is going to um, make a, 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 should be a rather educated presentation of, mm -hmm. of scriptural. At the bottom of the page in the chapter in, in Great Controversy <coughs> entitled, The Scripture is a Safeguard, there's this statement. None but those who have fortified the mind with the truths of the scripture will stand through the last great conflict. That's why we should be studying our Bibles. Okay. Well, we were mentioning why some of the those who, in the past, why should they have gone? Because they they're not going to stand through the final well the final conflict. And remember that God never tells us when then is coming. That's right. So each generation thinks they're the last, and they are for them. But what are the other reasons? <laughs> other reasons why why we should, we should go to church on. Well, okay, by worshiping on the Sabbath day, we affirm our belief that God is our creator. We say he created. We believe in a seven-day week, a creation week. He's our redeemer. He was the one who got the children of Israel out of Egypt, on, and he recommended that they worship on the Sabbath there at the foot of Mount Sinai. And three, the Sabbath is intended to be a good day of glorious celebration, fellowship, and sharing with our friends and with God. I don't know how you could ask for any better reasons. Well, in light of these facts, those who accuse Sabbath keepers of legalism, being in bondage, or of not even being truly Christian, clearly have not understand what the, understood what the Sabbath is all about. Well, what was going on, coming back to our passage in, in Luke 4, where Jesus went to the Sabbath, went to the synagogue and stood up, what was happening on that Sabbath in Nazareth? You know, Ken, I was just thinking there's there's one other reason why we should participate in the Sabbath. All those things are there, but it's because God is, has um, asked <coughs> us to do that yeah. because those things are there. Mm -hmm. And sometimes um, it's difficult to do that. There are times not so much necessarily in my life in this country, but there are times in other countries where 
Um, it's very, very difficult. Well, it would be easy to argue you could do those things on Sunday as well, but it's very difficult to do that. And, and one of the things that, that, that really makes people hang on to that is because not only are those things there, but, but God has, has said those things are there, and mm. that's, what, that's yeah. what I want you to do. I am reminded of one time <clears throat> we had the privilege of visiting Beijing in China. And we found, we had a friend who was an Adventist, an Adventist pastor, and he said, when you go there, try to visit the church in Beijing. Well, we had, we found just by accident, a very, very friendly Chinese guide who showed us all around the area. And finally we said to him, have you ever run across anybody, any group of people that worship God on Saturday? He says, no, I've never heard of such a thing. He said, well, you know, we, we understand there's a group who do worship on Saturday here in, in Beijing. Do you think there's any way you could find them? And so help me, he went home, and the next morning he came in. Yes, there is a group that worships on Saturday, and this is where they meet. He says, would you like me to take you there? We said, well, you don't, you don't need to go. I mean, but he was like, here, just, just hand this address to the taxi cab, and he'll take you right there. And we got there to the Beijing church, and I tell you, they had deacons at that church telling you exactly where you could sit because they, there, there was not a single space left between people. You were jammed in, and then the people, there was a whole huge big overflow area that was completely jammed. Yeah. You know, um, Ken, I remember sitting at the university church here quite some years ago when there was a, quite a well-known Adventist gentleman by the name of Bert Beach. Mm -hmm. um, and I think he's the father of, of a more contemporary Burt Beach. Mm -hmm. This man had, uh, was a well-known Adventist ambassador and so yeah. forth. And he told, he had very good Islamic connections way back then. And he told about being privileged to go into some sacred Islamic holy site. And... Um, it came up in the conversation about the Sabbath, and uh, it seems like one of the guards there, one of the attendants, said, you know, Sabbath is really, and Bert was saying this right from the pulpit, that the Sabbath, this was an Islamic person telling him that the, seventh, the Sabbath, the seventh-day Sabbath is really the correct Sabbath. We, even though we go on Friday, so it's, it's almost as if... <laughs> The Islamic, the Muslim people have wandered into the Friday and the Christians have wandered into the Sunday thing. It was an interesting story. Well, if you, if you read the writings of Ellen White carefully, you come across several very interesting things. I didn't, I, I already got almost six pages of stuff on this handout and you, our handouts are available if you want to look at them. There's some amazing quotations in this particular lesson. Don't thank me, I just found them. Um, if you want to go to our website at theox.org, that's T-H-U-X dot O-R-G, you'll find them there. One of them says that Jesus did such a beautiful job of reading the scriptures that even as a young person, he was frequently asked to stand up and read the scriptures. But then I'm going to read you something maybe even more amazing. This is from Spirit of Prophecy. Um, this is volume one, Spirit of Prophecy. It's a fairly lengthy passage, but it's... I'm sorry, it's volume 2, page 110 and 111. It's so startling, I thought we had to include it in our lesson for today. Jesus went to Nazareth where he was known as an unpretending mechanic. Interesting wording. And entered a synagogue upon the Sabbath. As was customary, the elder read from the prophets and exhorted the people to continue to hope for the coming one who would bring in a glorious reign and subdue all oppression. He sought to animate the faith and courage of the Jews by rehearsing the evidences of the Messiah's soon coming, dwelling especially upon the kingly power and glorious majesty that would attend his advent. He kept before his ears the hearers the idea that the reign of Christ would be upon an earthly throne in Jerusalem and his kingdom would be a temporal one. Christ, of course, is the Greek word for Messiah, um, for the Hebrew Messiah. He taught them that the, that Messiah would appear at the head of armies to conquer the heathen and deliver Israel from the oppression of their enemies. At the close of the service, 
Jesus rose with calm dignity and requested them to bring him the book of the prophet Isaiah, which is the Greek for Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and recover the sight to the blind, so to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable beer of the Lord. And he closed the book and gave it again to the minister and sat down. So Jesus did this passage we read a little bit earlier, right after someone had given a whole sermon about what the Messiah was going to be according to the Jewish legend. And the eyes of all of them that were in the synagogue were fastened on him. And he began to say unto them, This day is this scripture fulfilled in your ears. And all bear with him witness and wondered at the gracious words which proceeded out of his mouth. The scripture which Jesus read was understood by all to refer to the coming Messiah and his work. And when the Savior explained the words he had read and pointed out the sacred office of the Messiah, a reliever of the oppressed, a liberator of the captives, a healer of the uh, afflicted, restoring sight to the blind, and revealing to the world the light of truth, the people were thrilled with the wisdom and power of his words and responded to them with fervent amens and praises to the Lord. Jesus had not been educated in the school of the rabbis, yet the most learned rabbis could not speak with more confidence and authority than did this young Galilean. That raises a question that I think we need to raise. What language was the Hebrew, I mean, what language was Isaiah written in? <coughs> Hebrew, right? Yeah. And the Hebrew, and what language was Jesus' native language, his, home, his mother tongue? Aramaic. Aramaic. So he knew how to read and understand two languages at least. What other languages did he know? Greek? Uh, Greek. Uh, no question about He spoke in Greek sometimes or he understood people speaking to him in Greek. We have that recorded near the end of his life and probably spoke Latin as well. Yeah. So Jesus was a linguist. Anyway, when Jesus read this passage from Isaiah 61 and then told them that the passage was being fulfilled that day before their very eyes, what did they realize? Claiming to be the Messiah. He was claiming to be the Messiah. The kid from down the street, the guy who worked all those years in the carpenter shop is claiming to be the Messiah. How is he going to liberate us from the Romans? What can he do? Right? Well, I found out later. <laughs> when he started doing all those yeah. things, healing the blind and... Mm -hmm. But he wasn't, where was his army? He was supposed to be chasing out the Romans and he wasn't doing it. In fact, he had a tax collector as one of his disciples. Well, but also it says in that passage predicting the Messiah mm -hmm. that he will do those things. Yeah. He will heal the sick and raise the dead. and. So how in the world were they expecting, what, what kind of a king were they expecting? If they, they wanted ex another David. What well, do you he, mean? Never, he never gave sight to the blind or raised the dead or... But he conquered his enemies. But that's not what it says there. <laughs> <laughs> but they had other passages that they wanted to quote. But didn't they have some of that mixed up with the end of time? Yeah, exactly. Well, they wanted to be free from the Roman yoke, but not from the bondage of sin. That was the problem. Well, there's many passages in Scripture that talk about the Sabbath as a day of rest, a day that's tied to freedom, to liberation, even to recreation. And if we had time, we would read Hebrews 4, 1 to 4, Romans 6, 6 and 7, 2 Corinthians 5, 17, even 1 Corinthians 15, 51 to 53. But then we come to some problems. Why did Jesus choose to do a number of the fam famous healings that we know about that are recorded in Scripture on the Sabbath, especially in the Gospel of John? I mean, didn't he know that would just annoy people? Sure or what? Or, yeah? I'm sure he did, but he was out to prove that there was more to the Sabbath than this mumbo-jumbo of adhering mm -hmm. to hundreds of rules. But I'm going to put a slightly different slant on that. He gave his disciples the ability to do what? Preach the good news, heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, 
raised the dead. He gave that power to his disciples when he called them. We read about that. We talked about that last week. Don't you suppose that he did quite a lot of that kind of stuff himself? Mm -hmm. He did a lot of it. And so I'm coming, I'm, I'm growing in the opinion that the reason these particular events are recorded is because these are miracles that led to major confrontations with the Jewish authorities and led to Jesus expounding on various versions of his teaching. He probably did a lot of that kind of stuff other times, but it didn't lead to any big arguments, and so they're not recorded. Maybe I'm wrong, but that's a possibility. Well, and he could have uh, chosen to avoid the conflict by doing this on some other day. Yes. So he intentionally did it on Sabbath to teach something, to make a statement. This was civil disobedience. A careful look at scripture on the later history of the God's people down through the millennium makes it clear that the Sabbath is not just a day of rest. It is a day to worship God, to gather together, to share, to witness, to do good, and to spend time with family and friends. It has always been a mark of God's true people. Luke 4 goes on after that Sabbath story, starting with verse 31 to 37. And it says, as soon as I can get my cursor to work here. Then Jesus came, went to Capernaum, a town in Galilee, where he taught the people on the Sabbath. They were all amazed at the way he taught, because he spoke with authority. Now, what does that mean? He spoke with confidence, because he knows what he spoke with confidence, but not only that, he spoke in a way that they could all understand. And he used his illustrations that they all knew about. And, and, and the lessons that he intended to teach were, were patently obvious to people who were listening. There wasn't this, well, Shammai says this, but somebody else says that, and we're not sure, but the rabbis, you know, they disagreed. No, Jesus said, look, look at the way the plants grow. Look at someone keeping sheep. Look at, you know, and these are things that everybody knew about. So, you know, what is the most authoritative thing? When someone says something that you say, oh yes, I know that experience, and they say, this is the message, that's true. I mean, that's, isn't that the greatest authority of all? When you, someone says something and you, you recognize immediately, that's true. You know, this business of doing these miracles, these things on the Sabbath, <coughs> to, to prove a point, especially about the Sabbath and so on and so forth. That was, uh, am I supposed to do that? And the reason I ask that is, um, <clears throat> in the early days, there was a, an Adventist, uh, a recent convert, who, I, as I recall, was a miner, mm -hmm. had a, a mine mine and so forth. And so on the Sabbath, he decided he was going to go ahead and do his mining. And part of that uh, involved the, dis the discharge of, of uh, several sticks of dynamite. <laughs> <laughs> and um, this was a little ministry of his, and it didn't come across too favorably on on Sunday was when he was doing this. Oh, okay. And uh, Ellen White told him to not, to not do that. It yeah. was creating an irritant, and I, maybe you know this story, I don't know. No, not this particular So, um, I mean, wasn't he doing kind of what Jesus was doing? He was pointing these people to the correct you know, this is, this day is not the Sabbath, and I should work on this and carry out my livelihood. And Ellen White has a number of statements about that, which we don't have <clears throat> space in this lesson to talk about. But she says, if when the day comes, when there's a movement towards sacred, Sunday sacredness, and eventually a national Sunday law, and then an international Sunday law, she says, don't worship on Sunday, but do things that won't upset people. You can go around and give Bible studies, that's fine. You know, you can't, nobody can claim that you're, you know, not wishing. So I'm not supposed to be like Jesus in this respect? Well, you don't have to deal with people who were keeping the Sabbath in the way the Jews were keeping it, or maybe you should. Okay? But I, I, I think if you're dealing with dynamite, <laughs> depending how you do it, and I have used it years gone by, <laughs> Uh, a little bit goes a long way to disturbing the neighborhood. Yes. Uh, 
Well, it's, I think that's what he was. Today, an another rough <laughs> comparison of this is on <laughs> mid Sunday morning, open up a two stroke hand weed eater. And that's yeah. guaranteed to get some raised eyebrows. It's not a. Not necessarily way to influence friends and <laughs> on this particular people. Sabbath in the synagogue was a man who had the spirit of an evil demon in him he screamed out in a loud voice ah what do you want with us Jesus of Nazareth are you here to destroy us I know who you are you are God's holy messenger Jesus ordered the spirit be quiet and come out of the man the demon threw the man down in front of them and went out of him without doing him any harm how do you suppose that would go over in a church service today? <laughs> what? How did they? How did they respond to it? We have several stories in the Bible about mm -hmm. demon possessed and whatever. We don't. I remember growing up as a teenager hearing different stories about mm -hmm. demon possession, but you don't hear much about that anymore. Why did Jesus tell the demons not? to tell who he was? I mean, look, who, who's, who's speaking from this, through this poor soul? The devil. The devil. Does the devil know who Jesus is? Yes. Absolutely. Absolutely. He's proclaiming it. What's wrong with that? Devil's preaching the truth. You don't want to be praised by <laughs> yeah. the town rebel or the town... Um, Demon. Demon. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Why not? Guilt by association. Guilt by association. Okay. People might wonder if it was God or the devil who did something. But I, I, I think there's an additional thing we need to add. I, I agree with what you said. I think there's an additional thing we need to add. They knew. We've already discovered they knew for sure what the Messiah was going to do, right? What was the Messiah going to do in their view of things? Rescue. He was going to have an army. He was going to drive out the Romans. So if you, even if the devil says, you are the Messiah, they would say, okay, where's the army? Where's your horse? Where's, you know, when, when are you going to, I mean, they would, they would have gotten completely the wrong idea. And Jesus says, no, keep quiet about that. Let people discover what my kingdom is like from watching me for a while to actually experiencing it, not calling me the Messiah. So immediately, okay, already they've got in their minds something which is completely wrong. Okay. Um, Luke 6, 1 to 11, another one of those passages. Jesus was walking through some cornfields on the Sabbath. His disciples began to pick the ears of corn, rub them in their hands, and eat the grain. Okay, what's happening here? Now, my, this is a British translation I'm reading, and so it talk, calls it corn. What is it actually? What do we Americans call that? Wheat. Wheat. So here they are. The, the, the wheat is mature. They're, they're grabbing a head off wheat, and they're rubbing it together and blowing the chaff away, and they're eating the grain. Okay, what processes are they doing? Harvesting and They're threshing. harvesting and threshing. Okay. Winnowing. All those things are a clear violation of the Sabbath command, right? So they shouldn't have done those things, right? Not supposed to work on the Sabbath. Terrible thing. <clears throat> Isn't it work to pick up something with a spoon and put it in your mouth? Mm. Well, for some. quite like that. <laughs> <laughs> What's the difference? Kellogg's has done all that already. <laughs> <laughs> you still got to do the you still got to do the chewing. That's work too, right? Mm -hmm. Well, that was okay on the Sabbath. Okay, you think going back to the man who was healed there in in, in the synagogue just above, do um, you think people rejoiced to see this demon possessed man healed? Meanwhile, the Pharisees are doing what? Plotting. Plotting to kill him. How blinded were these men? I mean, that's incredible. Could we fall into that same trap? There's an interesting verse in Luke 9:51, which I don't think we have read and understood as we should. 
As the time drew near when Jesus would be taken up to heaven, he made up his mind and set out on his way to Jerusalem. And what's going to happen when he gets to Jerusalem? Crucified. So this, this is not talking about, okay, we're on our way to Jerusalem and we'll be there in five days from now. This is talking about a six-month process, more or less. And it's interesting that the next approximately eight chapters of, of Luke are almost exclusively in Luke. And it's talking about work that Jesus did among the Samaritans, work he did among the Pereans, and why would Luke be the one talking about Samaritans and Pereans as compared to John or Mark or Matthew? Because he's the non-Jew. He's the non-Jew. Jews he, wouldn't want to hear about those he things. Didn't, it didn't bother him to talk about Samaritans. Well, he sent this message ahead of him to this Samaritan village. We're on our way. Can we come and stay there? And what did they say? No. No. You're headed for Jerusalem. Get out of here. And what did James and John say? Let's call down fire. Why? Where did they get that idea? <laughs> From Elijah. It was, as actually turns out, it was right there in the very spot where Elijah had called down fire and destroyed more than a hundred men. So they were probably thinking about that experience. Well, um, another passage. This is in, well, I'm going to read you a couple of things. First one is from the, the Good News Bible, Mark 10, verse 1. Then Jesus left that place and went to the province of Judea and crossed the River Jordan. So now is he in, is he in Judea anymore? No. And once he crosses the river, he's now in Perea, isn't he? And he taught, and crowds came flocking to him again, and he taught them as he always did. American Bible, well, anyway, that's my translation. And then, this is Ellen White's explanation of all that. A considerable part of the closing months of Christ's ministry was spent in Perea, the province on the farther side of Jordan from Judea. Here the multitudes thronged his steps as in his early ministry in Galilee, and much of his former teaching was repeated. Desire of Ages 48, paragraph 3. So we've already talked about why Luke does that, while well, the other apostle, gospel writers didn't. Um, so we have these two miracles, one in Luke 13 and Luke 14. And Jesus responded after when they criticized him for performing his miracles on the Sabbath. The Lord answered him, You hypocrites, any one of you would untie your ox or your donkey from the stall and take it out to give it water on the Sabbath. Now here is this descendant of Abraham whom Satan has kept bound up for 18 years. And remember, this is the lady who was bent over and she couldn't straighten up. Should she not be released on the Sabbath? His answers, and this is very interesting, his answers made his enemies ashamed of themselves while the people rejoiced over all the wonderful things that he did. Now, why do you suppose it says that here, talking about this miracle, and it's such a thing is not mentioned anywhere when he talks about miracles done among the Jews? Thought about that? Over here in Perea, they were a little bit less restrained by the teachings of the scribes and the Pharisees and the control of the scribes and the Pharisees. And they were, they were happy to see somebody healed. They were thankful. They, didn't, they, they had a little more freedom in expressing themselves. They, that's wonderful. And meanwhile, also his enemies, he said, you know, people are praising and shouting God, to God. They were ashamed, and they should have been. So it showed that things were a little, the society was a little more open on the other side of the Jordan. Um, but of course, there were plenty of Jewish authorities over there trying to watch Jesus. Well, think of the story of this crippled woman. She had bent o been bent over for 18 years. Suddenly, she was able to stand up straight and walk like an ordinary human being. Can you imagine her feelings? Is it any wonder that she glorified God? It might be nice to, after all those years, be able to look at somebody in the face instead yeah. of at their shoes. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, imagine here, hi, how are you today? How you getting along? You know? Well, there's another story. Let's, uh, maybe we have time to look at it. Luke 14, uh, starting with verse 1. One Sabbath, Jesus went to eat a meal at the home of one of the leading Pharisees. 
Now, he's not in Jerusalem. He's not in Judea. He's not in Galilee. He's in Perea. What are the Pharisees doing over in Perea? Vacation home, maybe. Maybe a vacation home. Well, they had influence over there, but they just they weren't in charge of the government. So they didn't have the authority that they had back in Judea. A man whose legs and arms were swollen came to Jesus, and the biblical term is dropsy. And Jesus asked the teachers of the law and the Pharisees, does our law allow healing on the Sabbath or not? Well, I mean, you know, he has them trapped already. What can they say? No, you're not supposed to do good on the Sabbath? I mean, think about it. Didn't the Jews have a, have a tradition or a teaching that if you can do good and don't, it's, it's a sin? Mm-hmm. But they would not say anything, it goes on to say, because they, the answer was obvious. But it disagreed with what they wanted to teach, what they believed, so they just kept quiet. Jesus took the man, healed him, and sent him away. Then he said to them, If any one of you had a son or an ox that happened to fall on a well on Sabbath, would you not pull them out at once on the Sabbath itself? But they were not able to answer him about this. I wonder why. What kind of people are so bound up by their preconceived ideas, even wrong ideas, that they can't even respond to the truth? Well, the same kind of people that would want to um, take the life of a man who had just been raised from the dead. Yeah. <laughs> Which was the case of Lazarus. Yeah. was a man who Jesus raised from the dead, and because that was a threat against them, they, they plotted to, to kill him again. Well, frequently, Jesus used another approach in talking about why he worked on the Sabbath. He said, I work because my father works. Now, they knew what he was saying, didn't they? Look at this passage, and this is from Desire of Ages, page 283, paragraph 3. No other institution which was committed to the Jews tended so fully to distinguish them from surrounding nations as did the Sabbath. God designed that its observance should designate them as his worshipers. It was to be a token of their separation from idolatry and their connection with the true God. But in order to keep the Sabbath holy, men must themselves be holy. Through faith they must become partakers of the righteousness of Christ. So when did these other people worship? What was their day Sunday? of worship? M Monday, what we call they worshiped the sun, they worshiped the moon, they worshiped all kinds of creatures in various assortments of ways. They didn't, some of them didn't have a weekly worship. They went to, went to their temples whenever they felt like it. Well, in light of all this evidence from so many different places, how could so many people today be wrong about keeping the Sabbath? Is there a difference between the way Sunday keepers keep their Sunday and the way Sabbath keepers keep their Sabbath? Now, maybe that distinction is being blurred a little bit, but what's the difference supposed to be? A lot of Sunday keepers, what do they do? They go to church. Some of them even go to church on Saturday night. Some of them go to church on Sunday morning, and then what? You go out and eat. You watch the football <coughs> game. You watch the basketball game. You mow your lawn. People who keep the Sabbath believe if they follow the biblical teaching, that the Sabbath is supposed to be observed from Friday sundown to Saturday sundown, a full 24 hours. And it's not supposed to be a time for doing our own pleasure, as it says in Isaiah 58, doing our own business. Well, it has been suggested, I want you to think about this out there, it has been suggested that if you can convince someone that she or he needs to set aside a full 24 hours to worship God each week, it will be very easy to convince them, him or her, to move to Saturday instead of Sunday. You think that's true? We often emphasize the idea, well, this is the right day, Saturday. Not Sunday, not Friday, Saturday. Maybe we need to emphasize the fact that God asks us to give one-seventh of our time a full 24 hours, and if people are willing to accept that idea, it'll be easier for them to go to Saturday. 
Jesus also said something else of considerable interest. Mark 13, verse 22. For false messiahs and false prophets will appear. They will perfect, perform miracles and wonders in order to deceive even God's chosen people, if possible. So what about it? Do you think we might see false prophets and false Christs in our day? Yes. I think it's a possibility, yeah. It has already happened. Yeah. And is happening. Well, how would we compare, being very gentle now, how would you compare the teachings of the Pharisees about Sabbath and Jesus' day with the teachings of modern Christian church leaders who say the Sabbath is merely an antiquated legalistic Jewish tradition and how we should respond to them. Don't everybody speak at the same time. <laughs> no, I was just thinking it depends a little bit on the situation at yeah. the time, doesn't it? Yeah. Where you are. Uh, I think it's interesting that people that hear not necessarily what we're talking about here, but on radio that goes around the world that realize they're lacking in something seem to have very little problem in, t in, in absorbing yeah. the Sabbath. It's when we're more sophisticated that kind of gets blurred. Why, why is Sabbath so opposed by the devil? Well, that's a <clears throat> probably many, uh, many answers for that. Mm -hmm. But one thing, <clears throat> it, its primary purpose is to show that God is God, and God is the Creator yeah. of uh, of everything. And He rested on the seventh day. That's right. Okay. It's a day when we are spending time with God and not Him. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. So why does Jesus want us so much to recognize Him as the Lord of the Sabbath? Does that make a difference? Myra, are you saying you spend time with the devil on Monday? <laughs> Not on purpose. <laughs> <laughs> well, Jesus said a number of times, the Son of Man is the Lord of the Sabbath. And who is he talking about when he says the Son of Man? Himself. So now let me ask a question. How would you feel if I said, I'm going to give you an opportunity? Uh, let me just mention another interesting thing that happened to me this week. I was a young African woman that came in to see me as a patient. And she was just wanting some clearance because she's starting a school program. And I said, well, where, you know, I recognized that she was from Africa. It turns out that she was from Rwanda, to a place I had visited when I was out in Africa. And she was so excited that there was someone here that had actually been to her hometown. And it turns out that she won a lottery back in Rwanda, and she used her lottery money to come here. She was a registered nurse. Is coming here to learn to speak English more fluently and hoping to end up working here at least for a while before she goes back. Rwanda has officially changed its national language from French to English. Mm -hmm. How about that? Mm -hmm. That's really something for a whole nation to change yeah. its official language. Anyway, that was interesting. Um, what would it be like if Jesus said, I want to spend 24 hours with you? He doesn't even ask for all of that. How about the time you're sleeping? And it was so he's not really asking to occupy a lot of the time, but he says, "This is we're going to have a date once a week, yeah. and let's get together." And I got lots of stuff to teach you mm -hmm. from my father, the Infinite One. Do we do we act on the Sabbath as if we are privileged to spend time with the King of the Universe? Maybe fleetingly. <laughs> Maybe fleetingly. Um, think about what it would have been like if we, you know, we're told that at the third coming, thousand years, at the end of the millennium, there's going to be a panorama. It's going to show us a lot of things about the life of Jesus among, basically cover the whole history of the great controversy. What if you could take a snippet out of that and say, okay, I want to observe the family of Jesus for a 24-hour Sabbath. 
<laughs> what, what would that be like? You're referring to the time when he was growing up? Yeah. yeah. He, he, as, as a child in the, in, in, in the family in Nazareth. Be very interesting. It would be very interesting. I would suspect that they actually followed most of the traditions that the Jewish, of the mm -hmm. Jews that, uh, that the rabbis taught. Yeah. Some of them incorrect concepts. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But you have to weigh against that the fact that he was talking to the scribes and Pharisees when he was 12 years old. Mm -hmm. Not a lot of 12-year-old kids at that time, I think, or even now could do yeah. that kind of stuff. Absolutely. So somewhere there was some kind of liberality in today's definition is a little wrong. What I'm saying is he had access to a broader way of thinking here and there that he absorbed very early. Yeah. Well, in the Bible, we know several things. We know that he created the Sabbath to start out with. Exodus 20, 8 to 11, and Deuteronomy 5 tell us that we're supposed to remember the Sabbath. That's part of what we call the fourth commandment. It's the Sabbath commandment. <coughs> yeah, if we, in Exodus, because of creation and, and, yeah. and Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy, because, because of because liberation. Of liberation yeah. yeah. In Ezekiel 20, verses 12 and 20, that's a passage that's maybe not quite so well understood by a lot of people. Let me just... See if I can take us there really quick. I made the keeping of the Sabbath a sign of the agreement between us to remind them that I am the Lord, uh, I the Lord make them holy. And that's verse 12 and then verse 20. This is Ezekiel 20. Make the Sabbath a holy day so that it will be a sign of the covenant we made and will remind you that I am the Lord your God. So what's he saying there? This Sabbath is, and the way we keep the Sabbath, is a sign that we believe that we are his faithful, honest, true people. Isn't that what it's saying? Well, in that passage in Luke 6, which we read about harvesting the grain and so forth, Jesus went on to say something funny about David eating the showbread, the bread from the temple, what did that have to do with rubbing wheat between your hands? Well, rubbing wheat well, well, between your hands was nothing compared to what David did with the, I mean, the table of showbread, that was, Only that was, for, that was sacred, <laughs> that was pretty sacred stuff. Exactly. So do, <laughs> does, so is he, was Jesus saying, well, two wrongs make a right? I mean, if David did something that was wrong, now Jesus is doing something wrong. Does that make a right? Maybe he was saying, you don't make so much fuss about that, and that was a far greater yeah. um, sin than this. There's another interesting thing that many people haven't thought about, and this was not my idea. I, got, I heard this from somebody else. It's interesting to notice that Jesus is talking about David, what was, at the point where he ate that bread, what do we know about David's life? He'd been anointed king. He had been anointed to be the next king. What else do we know about it? That he wasn't king. He wasn't king. He was being pursued by Saul to prevent, if at all possible, for his be from becoming king. Okay? But as a result of all that, he ended up being the most famous king that they had ever had. Okay? Jesus had been anointed in what way? At his baptism. At his baptism by the dove and so forth. He'd been, so he had been anointed to be king, a different kind of a king. Had he become king? No. Not really. Not the kind of king they were looking for, that's for sure. So here we have not just, okay, here's David eating the showbread and here's Jesus rubbing wheat in his hands, but we have two kings that have been anointed but not yet had risen to power. Hmm, that's interesting. Can we be sure, well, uh, can we be sure that the Sabbath really falls on Saturday? Read any Bible, take your pick. A modern one will be a little clearer than some of the more old ancient ones. Luke 23, 54 to 56, and right on into chapter 24, verse 1. And there's no question. Ask a 
any Protestant and ask him why they worship on Sunday, they will tell you it's because Jesus rose on that day, which means that the Sabbath is the day before that, right? Right there. There are no verses in the New Testament which describe either Jesus or any of his disciples, um, or the apostles for that matter, worshiping on any day other than the seventh day Sabbath. Jesus performed amazing miracles on the Sabbath. We do not have that ability. But what can we do which would demonstrate our correct understanding of how to keep Sabbath? We can relieve pain. We can meet people's needs. We can share the gospel. However, the Sabbath is not for doing our own business. It is important to distinguish between the Sabbath as a doctrine and the Sabbath as an experience. What, what does that mean? Are you talking no napping here? <laughs> wow. How did we get to that? <laughs> <laughs> That's resting. Yeah. It's called lay activities. Yeah. I've heard that before too. Well, we need to understand clearly why we believe in the Sabbath, why we need to worship on the Sabbath, and then we need to experience the Sabbath in the way God wants us to experience the Sabbath. I mean, if, if it's cold and boring and not fun, we're going to figure out ways to sort of avoid it or, or to break it or whatever. Is observing the Sabbath just a way of separating ourselves from the majority of Christians? Is it more than just a religious routine? What's implied when we, when we talk about truly worshiping God on the Sabbath? Aren't we recognize him, recognizing Him as the Creator, the Redeemer, our example and our friend? Why do you think the Sabbath was singled out in the Bible and in the writings of Ellen White as the greatest final test of obedience at the end of this world's history? And I, and I quote, this is a Great Controversy, page 605, paragraph 2. The Sabbath will be the great test of loyalty, for it is a point of truth especially controverted. When the final test shall be brought to bear upon men, then the line of distinction will be drawn between those who serve God and those who serve Him not. The keeping of the true Sabbath in obedience to God's law is an evidence of loyalty to the Creator. Do we want to be on God's side or on the devil's side? Which side do we want to be on when the great final test comes? I don't, I don't think any of us have a question about that. Do we celebrate the Sabbath as a great final experience? Our kind and loving Father, we thank you for this opportunity we have to speak the truth the best we can, representing you the best we can before those who listen. May the truth come home to their hearts is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.